Good evening. You're watching the digital age. How much does the net have to play with terrorism? Is the net responsible for terrorism? I want to discuss that question tonight with you and with Lydia Khalil, who is a former counterterrorism analyst with the New York PD mm -hmm. and is presently at the Council on Foreign Relations. She has written a lot about this subject, and we're going to get into the use of the net and terrorism we do in one sec. But first, we're going to put up on the screen what you can see if you want to learn about the jihad, if you're a Muslim. What we're going to look at now is videos, or videos, from the net. And they are videos aimed at jihadists, and they're in Arabic. So let's put it up. <laughs> Okay, now I'm reliably uh, informed, not speaking Arabic, that the music you hear in the background is not a particular moment. It's uh, background music from Arabic hymns. Uh, but the, the videos themselves are frightening enough. But not, let me tell you about what another video says that I saw at the same time I was looking for these. Quotes, the Jew and Christians are enemies of God and want to destroy Islam and the Muslims. Muslims who fight the jihad will go to heaven and those who don't are wrongdoers. So the question for you is, what is the impact of uh, the, the internet on terrorism uh, is, for me, I was surprised to see, I have to tell you from my point of view, mm -hmm. I've heard about it, I hadn't looked at it before. Uh, I was really uh, depressed after looking at that stuff on the net. Well, uh, first of all, thanks very much for having me. It's great to be on the show. But um, when you do troll around the internet and you take a look at a lot of the propaganda and the videos and the photos and the commentary that's out there, it really is rather stark. Um, it's very graphic. It's very extremist in nature. Um, and you can really get caught up looking at them at just how um, extreme and violent the world view is that a lot of people who espouse these views. And they're all readily available for most of us to see there on the internet. Um, so I think your question was, what is the impact right. of all of this on people who uh, either espouse this ideology or who are interested in it? Right. Um, and with anything in terrorism, it's complicated. And I hear, I think it might be useful to kind of go back to a report that uh, my old digs put out in 2007, which was a the NYPD report on radicalization. And what the New York Police Department attempted to do was to study the process of radicalization. What are the phases? How does one become radicalized? And after you become radicalized, what does it take to make that jump into a violent attack? And here the internet plays an important part in all of those phases. So the first one is the pre-radicalization phase that they identified. Um, and I should say, you know, the report ha does have some problems. It's not perfect, but it's a really useful construct for us, I, I think, to kind of begin the conversation. So the pre-radicalization phase, uh, that's basically your point of origin before you become radicalized. Who are you? Where are you in your life? And for the vast majority of people involved in terrorism, they're really just ordinary people, completely uh, you know, the same as you and me, no type of special background whatsoever, no, not necessarily any type of um, association with terrorism prior. Then you have a self-identification phase, which is something happens to you, either in your personal life, or you become politically aware or religiously aware, and it's kind of this break where you say, the way that I was before is not correct. Uh, something happened to me, and then you start seeking something else. Now, for people who... Uh, Can I just stop you there? Because sure. I know you want to get into the other phases. Yeah. But uh, I've been uh, surprised how many born-again Christians uh, fit the pattern you thus described. In other words, something uh, happens in their life, mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, more than discovering religion, uh, a second divorce, or it's, it's a personal reaction to some event, mm -hmm. and you look for some 
thing to grab hold of. Are you talking about that sort of yeah, event here? It's exactly that right. same thing. And it's not, of course, exclusive to uh, Islamic terrorism or Muslims. I mean, right. everybody kind of goes through something like this in their life. Um, and, you know, people who are involved in other issues kind of wake up to that aha moment, you know, and they find something that f fills that void or something that kind of replaces something that they lost, whether they lose their job or there's a death in the family or they just all of a sudden become politically aware. So at that stage, the internet kind of serves as a gateway for them to see what's out there. So whereas before in their kind of pre-radicalization life, they would have used the internet just like how anybody else uses the internet, email, news, that kind of thing. In the self-identification phase, they use it to kind of seek out radical thought. That's where they become introduced to uh, this type of radicalism. So they take a look at those videos, or they come across commentary in a blog that's a, a jihadi blog or some sort of forum. And so then they're kind of slowly getting introduced to, to that type of ideology. Then you have the radicalization phase, which is, or sorry, the indoctrination phase, which is the radicalization phase. Okay, so let's, so the way you described it is that uh, it could be you, mm -hmm. it could be me, mm -hmm. and uh, we're onto the net and we see all the stuff we saw and heard what, the st what we heard, Yeah. Um, and then we get to the indoctrination stage, is that what you just said? Yes, the indoctrination and then, and stage. Uh, but how do I get from the point where I'm watching the net and I'm being indoctrinated? Am I, are those two separate thoughts? Can I be indoctrinated just by looking at the net or? Or do I have to talk to somebody? Well, it's it's not that simple. I mean, oh. many of us look at these images all the time, and we don't necessarily yeah, become indoctrinated, yeah, indoctrinated right. yeah. or radicalized. So right. those images aren't enough. It's that um, moment in that person's life that we referred to earlier that, that serves as a pathway for them to be susceptible to this indoctrination. So it's particularly, say, if you're from a Muslim background, and you are no longer satisfied with the traditional way that Islam has been preached in your family or practiced in your family or in your traditional mosque and you're saying I need to look for something else something more there has to be a real Islam quote unquote and if you go to the net you can find it there you know you can find people telling you what your mm. teachers and what your parents and what your imam has been telling you is not real this is what the real Islam is and so that kind of goes along the indoctrination phase. But you pointed to something really important to earlier, which is this group dynamic. And here in the indoctrination phase, this group dynamic is very important. Now, uh, what you have is when you delve deeper into internet usage, especially with jihadi uh, propaganda and videos and commentary and stuff, this is where the group dynamic plays more of a part. So you kind of self-select into a narrower group of like-minded individuals who espouse this right on the net on the net and the on the net right and so you're on these chat you know chat rooms and forums and blogs and stuff and so you can easily find like-minded people and you're chatting back and forth and because you're spending more time on the internet you're more isolated from you know the, quote unquote the real world and and so you kind of get, become more selective the group dynamic plays a more of a part and it kind of feeds that indoctrination and the last phase that the report. Well, let me just stop you because that, I find that mind boggling. I mean, I thought I knew a little bit about this, but basically you're saying I just be sitting at home mm -hmm. and I create my own whole community and that community indoctrinates me. Sure, it's kind of this group think, group dynamic. I mean, that is how a lot of it. Well, we usually, plays when you out. think of group think, group dynamic, if you think of cults, and this is not dissimilar, it seems to me, to what's going through with the cult. Some, yes, yeah, Because we've had cults uh, yeah. in recent history. But usually you think of a cult off and a you know, uh, uh, and, well, we had a big one in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all in the same house. Cults in the United States have always been in the same house. Yeah. And one looks at a cult and thinks, well, they're all there talking to each other. Yeah. You're not saying no house. You got the net. Yeah, the net is the house. I mean, wow. this new technology has broken down those barriers where you no longer have to be face to face in order to be radicalized. Now, there's di analysts differ on what it takes to move to the next step and whether the net plays an important part in that last step, which is what the NYPD report terms jihadization, which is when you make that final decision to say, I'm gonna do something about it, I'm already a believer in the ideology, I've been indoctrinated, and I need to do, I need to take action, I need to do something. Now, 
Analysts differ. Some people say, well, the net can also be responsible for that last phase as well. Some others, and I tend to kind of agree with this camp, that it takes more than the internet to get to that action, take action phase. That you have to, or it, let's put it this way, you can use the internet to get yourself to that last phase where you're going to take action. But will you be as effective working solely through the net and your connections on the net and whatever bomb making materials you find on the net versus you actually linking up with different people okay, who well, have... Okay, let's, let's, let's yeah. take, the, take the first of those two examples. Mm -hmm. Will you be as effective uh, without linking up with other people is what you just said, right? Right. Okay, so as I understand it, I can go through these phases, I'm sitting at home, then I decide I'm going to, I've gone over the edge, I'm going to go on the net and I can find out how to make a bomb. Yeah. And then what I do is I go out and make a bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, but since no one's told me how to do a bomb, mm -hmm. uh, the reason you say that may not be as effective uh, as other circumstances is that, uh, you know, I may screw up when I make the bombs. Uh, but putting aside the other view, mm -hmm. uh, you could do that all on the net without talking to anybody, isn't that right? I mean, other than the people you talked to on the net. Sure. Um, you don't have to take this next step about what you're about to tell us. So you got, you have a, yeah. you got a four phase job where someone starts off perfectly normal like you mm -hmm. and ends up making a mom just because the net told you how to do it. I find that astounding. I yeah, mean, I absolutely mean, astounding. Yeah, it's more. And, and, but anyway, let's, yeah. uh, let's go to the next, to the next phase where sure. uh, that's not enough for you. So what happens, uh, this all, all other alternative, what happens? Right, well if you have access to, you know, people on the outside or if you have access to uh, kind of real life terrorist operatives and terrorist trainers, then that's where you kind of go outside of the internet and link up with them. And the internet may have led you to a certain degree to that point, but it's, it's not sufficient in order for you to be very effective. Well, would the internet be necessary to link up with them to begin with? In other words, um, okay, I want, I'm now want to take the next stage. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered, you say to yourself, but how do I, how do I find the people? Yeah. Can you find those people on the net? You know, in the old days, call them up, send them an email or whatever, yeah. and then go see them? Or would you meet them in, uh, at a mosque? Well, I'll give you a real world example that might be very instructive on that. Um, a couple of months ago, we had the arrest of an individual called Tarek Mahana in Boston. And he lived um, in the suburbs of Boston, middle class family. His family has lived in the United States for decades, pharmacy student. He got radicalized over the internet and in talking with a bunch of friends. Now, he tried to use the internet to connect with uh, terrorist operatives in Syria, in Pakistan, and Iraq. And he tried to connect with them on the internet that way. And he emailed them and he said, we want to come and do jihad with you. We want training. Will you accept us? And he got nowhere because they don't trust this, you know, who, who is this guy to them? They don't know. Yeah, He's some nameless a, face on the internet. We don't know if he's FBI, serial, serious. Could be New York Police Department. Exactly. He could be anybody. So the only thing that he could do was get a couple of handguns and what he was plotting to do was to shoot up a mall, which is a very serious attack. But it's nowhere near as serious as he could have been if he had linked up with those people. And in his case, the internet was not sufficient enough to do that. Then you take a look at... Well, uh, it could it be? Could it be... In other words, we've got these two examples, one well, homegrown, mm -hmm. and then we have the guy who wants to go someplace and get trained. Yeah. In your example, they wouldn't accept his request. Yes. Is it possible, nonetheless, to make the contact, go to... Uh, the training camp through the net, or do, is it necessary to have a human intervention at this point? It's conceivable, but it's very, very difficult. In most of the cases that we've seen, it just doesn't happen that way. You have to have some sort of other reliable connection going forward uh, if you want to take that next step and get in touch with real live operatives. So, how would you have a? Uh, I mean, you're sitting here. How would you have? You mean how would you have a reliable connection? What would you do? Well, um, or what would I do? Well, a, a lot of nicer it, way of saying it. A lot of it depends on how can you get into those hot spots. Um, I'll give you another example. Take um, David Headley, who has been in the news recently, right. um, an American of uh, both mixed American and Pakistani right. descent, who was involved in the Mumbai attacks. Now he did actual live training with Luxury Toyba, the LET in Pakistan, and. That was the, his only in into doing some sort of serious type attack like that. Or Najib Azazi, the Afghan American who was recently ar arrested um, in New York on suspicions of doing um, 
a large attack in New York City. Well, how about uh, Abdullah Abdul Mutullah? Exactly, or the the Christmas bomber. I mean, he had links in Yemen because he went to do language training in Yemen. He got caught up with some. Um, right, but how did they all get to the? How do they all get to meet these people? Well, he first went to Yemen on language training, and since he was kind of susceptible... This is the Christmas bomber. The Christmas bomber, since he was susceptible to that message. So, well, let me just stop for a sec. Yeah. So he had to find, somehow he had to get himself to Yemen and find the people who would train him. That's right. But the Internet did aid him in this. He made connections with uh, an American preacher based in Yemen, whose name is well known by now, al, -Al Laki, right. and he... Pro we don't know the exact details, but he probably guided him to certain individuals in Yemen. Now, he still oh, needed to make those connections oh, in see. Yemen. But now, he, uh, now, he met this uh, internet imam. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks to me he may have met him on the internet to the extent that he heard the preacher preach when he went to a Muslim place in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So That's right. I think what you're saying is it's possible he heard the imam, he goes to Yemen to find the imam? I think he became connected with him on the internet. I think they exchanged messages, I if I'm remembering the news uh, reports correctly. Um, and then once he got to Yemen, he established connections with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen. And, but it's only there that he actually obtained explosives and training and was able to attempt to conduct a serious plot. So there's a big difference between what he did and what Tariq Mahana did in Boston. I mean, he was only able to kind of muster a couple of handguns. And so we got the homegrown, the homegrown terrorists, and we got the the trained terrorists. I guess that we're, we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, but they both, but they both uh, have their origin on the internet. Well, I read in the newspaper all the time that um, the uh, Al Qaeda is recruiting, which uh, implies to me that. Uh, they're knocking on people's door and they're picking their arm up and, and taking them away. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That's not exactly how they're doing it. They're doing it in a more subtle but pervasive way. And the way that they're doing it is sending out a very clear and simple but effective message to Muslims around the world and to disenfranchised peoples around the world. And they're doing it on a variety of messages. Um, they do it through videos, they do it through messages, they do it through um, a bunch of Media outlets like Al Sahab Media is a media outlet associated with Al Qaeda. The Global Islamic Media Front is another one. There are numerous others, uh, Al Furqan Media Front, and they're extremely prolific in these videos and these messages um, and propaganda that they put out. Now, there's another phenomenon happen happening as well, which is kind of, you can call it a, a spontaneous, homegrown, homegrown isn't the correct word, but some sort of spontaneous. Um, growth of these type of messages on the net, in videos, in different uh, places that are not directly associated with Al Qaeda, but are spreading that message because they buy on buy onto it. And this message is, like I said, simple and clear. It's that the Muslim nation in the world has been put down by Western powers, particularly the United States, and in order for the Muslim nation to rise up and to become united, they need to join together under a caliphate and oppose the United States and Western powers. So therefore, it is jihad, or it is imperative on you to attack these Western interests so you can um, improve the lot of the Muslim community. So that's not dissimilar to the message we saw at the beginning of the show, is it? Sort of gen general propaganda? Mm -hmm. It's all general propaganda. But it's, um, it's, it's very effective because even though there are people out there who despise Al-Qaeda, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, and disagree with their tactics, they kind of sort of agree with that message. I mean, if you talk to, you know, I hate to use this example, but if you go and talk to somebody on the street, uh, a Muslim in Egypt or a Muslim in Pakistan, and say, what do you think of Al-Qaeda? They'll say, oh, horrible, horrible, you know, kill innocent people, we don't want to have anything to do with them. Well, what do you think about the fact that the United States is, you know, putting Muslim countries down, whether it's through its foreign policy or otherwise? They say, yeah, we agree with that. That's true. So it's a really kind of subtle uh, interplay that's happening here, where you may agree with their message that they're espousing, yet at the same time, you can despise the organization, but you are still susceptible to the radicalization process, if that makes any sense, because of this message. I find this one of the more frightening conversations I've ever had. Well, it's really... I, I mean, I'll tell you why, because my concept 
generally speaking, is the Al Qaeda out there recruiting. Okay, so what you do is keep your eye on the door, and when they come and knock on the door, you, you get them, and mm -hmm. then they, they can't recruit. You know, they can't take the person away, or they can't do this and this. But what you're telling me now is that a knock on, there's no knock on the door, and it's very hard to figure out uh, who is susceptible to all this, and unless you start with the concept you started with, everyone is susceptible. If everyone is susceptible to it, how in the world do you ever do you ever deal with this? Now we got all sorts of uh, uh, ways to deal with 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 terrorism, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, some people think we should invade Iraq. Uh, some people think we uh, should put more troops in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think we should invade Yemen. Uh, some people think that no, the only way to do it to stop terrorism is is with drones, because once they're all there and been recruited, you know we can find them and we can bomb them. But what you're telling me is they're not all there; they're here, maybe. So, how in God's name do you ever deal with this phenomenon? Because if you want to nip it in the bud, you've got to find that that uh, a person like the Christmas bomber, mm -hmm. who is uh, subject to uh, radicalization, even before his father goes and says, "Hey, he's gone to Yemen." You've got to, you've got, uh, you've got to see them in the. How do you do it? You got to see them in the households. I find this frightening. Well, it's not a, ma it's not a matter of here or there or tracking this certain individual. It's really about combating the message, and that's where we're weakest at. We're very good at chasing down individuals that we know of, getting intelligence leads. Um, striking down terrorist operatives with drone strikes. We're really good at that. But where we're bad is combating the message. And this is where we really need to focus our efforts on. And this is where this whole issue of radicalization and the internet and all that stuff comes together with the message. We need to find a way to counter this radical ideology with an alternative message. And one that's not hackneyed or overdone or, you know, very too obvious. We need to do it in a way that um, will reach the, the people that are susceptible to this message in a very sophisticated way. And it's honestly one of the things that surprises me about the United States. I mean, we have Madison Avenue right here in Manhattan. We have done incredible propaganda during the Cold War and World War II. Why is it when we come to the terrorism fight it's been so difficult for us? And it shouldn't be. We have, you know, it, America has, is a major communications machine. We just need to apply that machine to radicalization and terrorism. Well, one of the problems may be that we don't see what the problem is. When uh, Bush uh, dealt with this question, uh, he sent his closest advisor, whose name I can't remember at this moment, to uh, go to Muslim countries mm -hmm. and to uh, spread the message. And it was an absolute disaster, because as soon as she stood up, stood up everyone started screaming at her, and she couldn't, uh, couldn't answer them. And, uh, she wasn't really dealing with the problems. She was trying to do it her way, talk to, talk, talk to small groups. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're not talking about talking to small groups. I mean, for example, uh, they're up there, the enemy's up there. Mm -hmm. I don't like that word. The, uh, Al I don't like Al-Qaeda either. What do I say? The terrorists. Mm -hmm. the, I don't like Al-Qaeda because I think anybody can be an Al-Qaeda. Yeah, all the people, all the people anymore? you talked about in your example sure. say, hey, I'm an Al-Qaeda. I don't like that right. because they're, yeah. really, they're really terrorists. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, what we're talking about is, is a uh, communication device that reaches everybody, including, including would-be terrorists. Uh, I mean, what would you do yourself? I mean, I understand a message, mm -hmm. but uh, how, do you, how do you combat that? I mean, you know, usually when you think, I mean, I'll ask you my own questions. I'll let you That's have okay, a maybe you have yeah. a better answer. No, no. no, no, you'll let you have an answer too. But you know, when you're in a political campaign, as soon as somebody says something bad, you quickly get up there and say something bad against them. Right. But go ahead, how do we do with them? Well, I think the approach of the current administration, they're starting to take the right step. I mean, I said that America is a really powerful brand and America is a communication mas machine. And so is the Obama brand right now. Um, I made a kind of an argument a while ago in an op-ed piece called Hope as a Counterterrorism Strategy, where, you know, I argue because of the popularity of the current pre president, we can use this to kind of ease ease the rhetoric, you know, ease relations between the Muslim world. And the administration is doing that. But it's not enough. I mean, you have to kind well, of... Well, you can't, you know, uh, if we were talking a year ago, you could say Obama would have made a great 
a great big difference. He has made a difference. Yeah. But let's face it, he's all tied up with a lot of domestic stuff. It's hard for him to get his message out. Sure. So okay. So what else? Well, I mean, he ha I mean, he did the Cairo speech, which was very, yeah. very effective and stuff. But um, you know, I you talk to a lot of people in the Arab world, and they say, okay, great speech, but what next? You know, it's not just, you know, I don't want to say it's just about the message. The message is very important, but you have to back it up with, with certain things. And it's not necessarily. Like what? Well, it's not backing it up with things that are. Uh, My goodness, we've reached, we've reached the end. Already? Yeah. Well, we're going to have to. Is the net to blame for terrorism? Uh, yes or no? Yes, but it's complicated. Yes, but it's complicated. Yeah. Well, that's all right. That's, good. that's okay. <laughs> hey, Lydia, thanks. Thanks for having yeah, me. I mean, a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Hope you'll come back. I hope so. Thanks. And I hope you'll come back next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night and have a good week.